uh, quantum computation and showing that this doesn't extend what a Turing machine can do. <coughs> um, there's, there's nothing, there, there's nothing uh, non-standard about the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the quantum computer, except for the fact that it does things more efficiently. And um, uh, so, so there's a lot of interest, of course, in quantum computing because uh, you know it, it'll play a big role in the decrypting and so on if uh, if it can be uh, um, finally um, built in some kind of effective form. But uh, here's David Deutsch. He's, he takes it a bit further. He says, "Well, we can get conscious machines. Um, uh, you know, I, I've, uh, I've shown quantum computation can be reduced to the Turing model. I'll I'll reduce." Um, Somebody will reduce um, uh, conscious uh, thinkers to, to it eventually. And here's, uh, here's Martin Davis, the guy who um, solved Hilbert's tenth problem with other people. And he's, uh, he's, uh, he's famous for taking on uh, uh, people that have come up with models that go beyond, beyond what the Turing machine can do. And um, he's, he's claiming that, uh, that they're, they're wasting their time. The Turing machine is, uh, is, is all there is as far as uh, uh, computation goes. But uh, there, there are, um, I, I, I don't know if people, uh, how many people are a member of the ACM here? Uh, uh, few, oh, good, great. A few people, oh, a few people who know what. Uh, uh, know a lot of things. Good. Um, okay, so uh, ACM, this is like the biggest. Uh, gathering of uh, computer scientists in, in, in the world and very, uh, very influential, very important, very um, uh, mainstream in, in a sense. But here they are. Um, we've lived with the Turing machine as a standard model for a long time and it still is the standard model. But there are, there are kind of um, questions being asked about the adequacy of the model. And uh, they have this symposium on um, what, is uh, what is computation. Uh, now, some people have complained about them having this, uh, this symposium. Uh, if you take Lance Fortnow, he's, uh, he said, well, actually, um, there isn't any question. We know what computation is. But other people, are, they're looking at, um, uh, here's a contributor to the, uh, the debate in, in this symposium. And what he's, what he's uh, talking about is um, the fact that um, if you look at something like the internet or you look at um, computation in nature, for instance, you're not um, seeing what the logicians see, which is uh, the computation of a function. Um, what you're doing is you're seeing something more complicated. You're seeing a kind of computational process which um, is actually, um, you can read off functions, but it is certainly not the computation of a function um, per se. So, um, so he calls this the, the mathematician's bias. Um, we, we've got processes now. We've got the internet, for instance, and uh, the internet is um, nowadays is developing into something with um, uh, is a hugely complex uh, computing um, uh, uh, environment, which uh, doesn't really fit into. Uh, it uh, doesn't really fit into this kind of rather simple logical um, picture that we've had uh, up to now. So, so there are questions being asked. And of course, if you look at, um, uh, there are, there are, here's another kind of very kind of um, uh, careful, mainstream sort of um, creative uh, computer scientist and um, Turing Prize winner. And there he is, he's saying, well, maybe, if you look at the physics, you, you look at uh, computation in physics, say, um, maybe you'll find that um, you can, uh, you've got computation there, um, uh, which, is, um, uh, which is going to upset the, uh, the standard model of computational classes and so on that, uh, that, uh, that one works with. So questions uh, variously. Um, now, I'm not sure whether you want to look at this. It's, it's a little bit... Uh, it, 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 okay, it's, it's a mathematician in, uh, in uh, computer science guy, uh, guys here. He's, uh, he's rather keen on uh, 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 models of computation, uh, uh, category theory, topos theory, and so on. I, I, I think there are people in computer science who, who take... Who, who take uh, uh, 
um, uh, take these models uh, seriously. But um, as he says that um, uh, there's, a, there's a problem with um, the, the standard model. He's saying that um, uh, if, you, if you compute using a Turing machine, then essentially um, the end, the, uh, the end uh, result is, com is contained in what you started with. So really all you've done is you kind of like um, take a piece of information and make it look a bit different. And you haven't really done anything very, um, uh, you haven't done anything very kind of satisfying. So, so he says, so he asked rhetorically, I think, you know, why bother computing the result? Well, of course, we know, we know why in the practical context, but, uh, but why, why do we bother computing the result if we don't um, uh, get something new? So then he asks this, um, now, now this is kind of a, a very radical question. If you'd asked this a few years back, um, people wouldn't have answered it if they were leading computer scientists. Um, can information increase in computation? Now, of course, uh, this is, this is uh, uh, connected with the fundamental laws of thermodynamics and so on. And the answer, the answer is no. Um, if, you, if you get increased information somewhere, then you've got decreased information somewhere else. And, and so, um, so the, answer, the, the conventional answer is no. But um, maybe, uh, maybe um, think more about what you mean by computation you get a different answer. Now, back to, uh, that, that was all about disembodied computation. Back to embodied computation. Well, of course, anybody who's working in the IT industry knows that machines are, are tricky, that they're, they're, not, they're not just um, abstractions that uh, you can t take off the page. Uh, there's an awful lot of work to be done in um, making sense, making uh, materializing your abstractions. And uh, you, you've, got, you've got people like, um, people who are really um, uh, essentially working engineers who, who made important contributions to uh, uh, the history of the computer. This Conrad Rad Zusa, who, who was um, a uh, creative uh, engineer back in the 30s, came up with something that looked pretty much like um, an electronic uh, a computer uh, as, as it developed later on. Um, here's, the, uh, here's the guy, of course, that gets the credit for the first computer in, in America, anyway. And uh, he, um, uh, how many people know the story of Atanasov and Eckert and Walsh? The, uh, I guess. Um, you, no. A lesson that you, you always have to tell your, um, or at least I always tell my graduate students: if you're working on a problem, be careful who you talk to about it. Um, not everybody's generous, and uh, and things can take uh, funny, uh, peculiar twists. Atanasov had um, back in the late, uh, I guess by 1941, he, he had um, um, a, a, um, an almost working electronic computer, a programmable electronic computer. Um, it never worked properly. I mean, uh, it, the, the Berry Atanasov um, computer it never really worked, but. Uh, but the thing was, he had, he had good ideas. Essentially, he, 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 he could have done it, probably if he had more time. And um, Eckert and Morshley went and talked to him. And big mistake, because um, they went away and put huge resources into building um, the first computer. And, um, and then they tried to um, patent it. And uh, up pops John Atanasov and says, well, actually, you talk to me. And uh, your, your computer is based on my ideas. And uh, the courts believed him. And so, uh, you know, there's a, lot of, um, there's a lot of substance in this. And uh, uh, he won the case, and he, he was the inventor of their computer. And uh, it was a, a very sad story. And of course, as we all know, in science, there's a, all, there's a lot of um, uh, mis. Uh, uh, a, a lot of lack of uh, recognition of what uh, people do, and a lot of bitterness uh, as a result of that. People, um, people uh, live their lives um, uh, regretting things that have um, happened in the science. Anyway, Eckert and Morshi, they, they, um, they, they had um, a, a, a very, um, they, they had a stored program computer by 1951, uh, a commercial one in fact. Um, 
Maurice Wilkes, where did he, 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 had, um, he had a stored program computer, how did he get it? Well, he went to uh, some seminars given uh, in, uh, in uh, Philadelphia and he got some really good ideas about how to build a computer. He rushed back to Cambridge and thought, right, I'm, uh, I'm a very uh, effective um, careerist and what I'm going to do is I'm going to build my little computer very quickly and it's going to be the first one. Well, actually, no, the first one was probably uh, the Manchester baby. And what? Of course, the, the history's, co history's uh, complicated because they had, an input, they had some nice um, ideas about how to store information and so on. And they did have um, a computer which um, embodied the uh, idea of the universal Turing machine. Um, but it didn't really compute anything. It, was, it wasn't much more than a toy. It wasn't useful. And uh, so, in a, uh, so in a sense, all, all these people had um, you know, claims to first computers. Um, that, that's that's the, really the first stored program computer. That's the first one that really was useful. Um, this, this was a, a very nice um, commercial uh, uh, proposition. A lot of these others were, were programmable computers. So here's the famous uh, Charles Babbage. His his um, his, pro, his his machine. If he could have, if he had the engineering uh, uh, facilities to uh, build his um, um, analytic engine, then, then he, he could have uh, he could have had the the first programmable computer. Of course, um, Ada Lovelace would, would have been the well, she was the first programmer in a sense. Um, so the other interesting, oh, Colossus, was that the first computer? Some people say it is, no, it's, it's not. It's, um, it used, um, it didn't have the stored program, so it, it was programmable, and one could say that it was what you call Turing complete. Um, it, it, could, it could be made to uh, simulate uh, other, other uh, computers. And there's any ENIAC. Uh, this is what Andrew Hodges calls is a, a glorified calculating machine. I, th I think he's probably a, a over overdoing the belittling of um, of uh, the ENIAC, but uh, but you know complicated history. Um, and then of course in uh, in, in, in Bletchley Park there was an awful lot of work going on, which um, um, was buried after the war, literally buried. I mean these 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 his Turing's um, uh, bomb, which, which was kind of this was like the first uh, machine they really had at Bletchley Park. Again, complicated history. That uh, they they had uh, they had they had a, a kind of prototype of the bomb uh, in in Poland before the war, and, um, and so again, there's a collective nature to, to the science here. And here's it looks little places. Here's, here's people arriving at Bletchley Park. Um, actually, there were there were like ten thousand people working there by the end of the war. Uh, this this was uh, this was um, a, a nice prototype. It wasn't a computer in, in the sense of the modern sense. Here's here's Turing's computer. He he had a report as well, um, and um, he his report was around the, t at the same time as. Um, uh, as von Neumann's, no, nobody knew anything about it because it all became rather secret and, uh, uh, and the von Neumann one was the one that uh, the Americans used. Uh, the pilot ace that Turing was working on was finally built in uh, around 1950 but by that time Turing had got fed up and uh, with the funding problems and frustrations with his ideas for building it being scaled down and he'd gone off to Manchester by that time but uh, it was actually a good computer and it uh, was commercially uh, marketed. Uh, and here's, 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 here's our uh, Here's, here's our peripheralized um, Turing. The, the, the photograph is kind of like, it's kind of expressive of uh, uh, Turing's role in Manchester where they were building uh, uh, early computers. Here he is, he's, he, he, did a bit of, he did some programming and he did some, uh, um, he, did, he used the computers in the, in the dead of night and so on when other people weren't around to do, do things on the, uh, uh, on the, the Riemann hypothesis, you know, bits of mathematics and things. But uh, anyway, he, oh, oh, he did produce some, he did produce some, a, um, a programming um, handbook for the, uh, uh, for anti-Mark I, which um, the, the collected works, has anybody got the collected works? Hugely expensive. Nobody can afford to buy it. But um, uh, yeah, it, 
it's Elsevier, of course. Elsevier, um, they, <laughs> they, uh, they produce a very nice four-volume set of the collected works, but um, if they'd use thinner paper and, um, uh, and uh, uh, had a fat enough volume, they could have got the whole lot in one volume and, and charged about a quarter, you know, I don't know, a fraction of the price they did. One volume cost about £170, I think. Anyway, um, so, so in, in the collected works, there's a, there's a uh, one of the writers there kind of expresses a bit of disappointment with this programming book because uh, it says that it's not the best Turing that, that there is. But uh, anyway, he, he did work on these things. Yeah, and he was interested in computer chess. Uh, Shannon's, uh, uh, Claude Shannon's the person who's remembered for the beginnings of computer chess, but uh, um, uh, almost as early as that. Um, uh, Turing, uh, Turing was working on computer chess, uh, and there's an interesting guy called Dietrich Prince who uh, was also in Manchester. He he um, he, um, he was taught by Einstein and various other famous people before the war, uh, and uh, of course, uh, because of developments in Germany, fled to uh, the UK and uh, ended up in Manchester, and uh, knew knew Turing and uh, worked a, a bit on computer chess. Uh, Right, okay, here's, here's real mathematics. Computers can't do everything. And uh, here's, here's, um, here's the famous um, uh, David Hilbert, the most famous mathematician of his time. Um, he's giving a speech in um, Königsberg in September 1930, saying there's no such thing as um, an unsolvable problem. And of course, as we were, as uh, people, uh, logicians know anyway, uh, in another part of the town, talking to a rather... Um, uh, less distinguished audience, there was Kurt Gödel, I think, like the, the day after or the day before, um, uh, describing his incompleteness theorem. And um, that was the beginning, of course, of... Um, that, that, I, I guess that was the beginning of uh, computer science as well, in a, in a sense, although it wasn't until you had the machine model that, uh, that you really had something that computer scientists could use. But... Um, but as, as, as we now know, um, that, that didn't work. And um, there are lots of unsolvable problems. There are, there, are lots of, um, there are lots of functions which can't be computed by Turing machines. There's a, there's a kind of blunt instrument proof of this, which is that um, um, you know that the number of functions uh, in Cantor's um, sense is uh, more than the number of um, uh, uh, numbers and, and since you've got uh, a listing of the programs, you, you've, um, you've you've only got um, a count, you've only got a countable number uh, paired up with the numbers, and so there are lots there are lots more um, functions than uh, than you can uh, compute. But what uh, what Turing uh, did and what Church did was uh, came up with actually quite down to earth problems, which um, which are not computable by. Um, uh, not so, not decidable by um, computers. And it's the famous halting problem. You can't. Uh, there's no. There's no computer program to tell you whether um, uh, a program's uh, whether a program a program on a given um, input is um, uh, going to uh, compute, going to halt. And then there's there's this um, quite counterintuitive uh, theorem, which says that you can't even have a program to tell whether a sentence in natural language is, um, is logically valid. And of course that's counterintuitive because everybody, everybody believes that if, uh, if somebody says something to them, they're going to be able to tell if it's a logically valid statement or not. And you know, they can tell if it's a, a mistaken logically or not. Well, no, it's not true. There's no, there's no, uh, well, okay, if the human brain is doing more than a computer, well, the, the, uh, the jury is still out. Now, um, other, other kinds of um, instances of incomputability. Well, people are looking for um, uh, elements of the real world which are not computable. And a prime, there, there are two, well, I, I think I um, identify two prime sources of incomputability. Um, this is one of them. And um, it's uh, uh, quantum, uh, qu quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics, uh, you know that uh, 
that in quantum mechanics, you can, have, for instance, you can have um, a radioactive um, substance decaying. Um, you've got um, uh, you've got a nice model which uh, will tell you that um, uh, will give you computable pro probabilities um, governing the, the decay of this uh, this uh, uh, radioactive substance. But if you look at what's happening with individual electrons or, or, or atomic particles, um, uh, you don't have a way of predicting what the indivi individual particles are doing. Now, of course, in, uh, uh, in, uh, in the, back in the real world, um, you're really not interested in what an individual um, uh, atomic particle is doing. You're only interested in what the uh, substance as a whole will, uh, is, is happening to the substance as a whole. So. Um, so you've got a standard model, which is fine, but underlying that, there's, there's a, a, a kind of incomputability, which uh, there's a paper by uh, uh, Chris Kaluda, and uh, he's a computer scientist, and Carl Spozil, who's a, a physicist, which uh, suggests that um, uh, uh, quantum randomness is, is actually incomputable. And um, right, well, we'll talk about um, the other challenge to computability in the real world, which is thinking. Um, nice thing is that um, those exam the examples we saw of incomputability are kind of down to earth and uh, they kind of, they suggest that they suggest that the real world is full of incomputability. And uh, here's Nature. This is uh, here's a part of the cover of Na a recent issue of Nature, which was a Turing special. And uh, in which they do have uh, uh, an article on uh, incomputability, which is uh, quite something, really. I, actually, I'm told that a few years back they did have another article on incomputability, but I think it, it is significant when it appears in uh, an important journal like Nature. Anyway, um, Turing was interested in actually approaching incomputability in some computable way. And he noticed that what you can do is uh, you can approximate. Uh, think, th there may be um, uh, there may be objects which are incomputable, but you can approximate them, and um, uh, this this in a sense may bring incomputable objects within um, w within the kinds of uh, framework of uh, computability that we're, we're we we we're developing, um, and um, he, he had this idea of. Um, uh, going beyond what's called the Turing barrier, um, uh, using uh, um, human ingenuity. Now, I'm not really going to talk about this. This is, this is the 1939 paper, which is very hard to read, yet very technical. Um, but he, he does come up with this. Uh, it, it, the, the idea is to kind of construct a hierarchy which takes you beyond what, to what you can compute. What, what he finds is that the way he goes up this hierarchy is hard to um, uh, trace. So what he does is he, he brings a lot of incomputability within um, this, this hierarchy. Uh, he uses um, uh, computable ordinals to notate his, his um, hierarchy. And then, and then what he finds, that having brought a lot of incomputability within what looks like a computable framework, there's a problem in identifying how you work, how, how you work within this hierarchy because you can't identify the ordinals that you're notating the hierarchy with. So, uh, but the, the, he, he has this habit of um, having a hugely technical paper and then dropping a, a, a kind of intuitive comment into it. And uh, he, he has this, that, uh, where he says that um, what, what he's been trying to do is um, uh, eliminate the need for intuition by having an ingenious hierarchy. Um, but actually, what he's come up with is uh, a proof of the reverse, which is that actually the ingenuity is not necessary. There is still a need for intuition. In other words, something that will uh, identify um, uh, incomputability. Um, Right, back, back into something a bit more uh, tangible. Uh, famous Mandelbrot set. What's happening there? We've got, um, we've got an object in uh, the complex plane. Don't, don't, don't have to worry about that. But uh, it's, uh, it, it's, um, it's an object which is generated by a very simple, um, very simple, uh, a very simple equation. And um, 
what the what the equation does is it kind of generates uh, complex numbers which you put into the representation of the com uh, complex numbers, and uh, you, you end up with um, uh, you end up with um, uh, this is an overview of Mandelbrot sets. But what what we all know, of course, is that uh, you can um, simulate this on on a computer screen, and you can go deeper and deeper and deeper into it using computational methods. Um, isn't, that looks like something that's computable. In fact, I embodied. Um, but no, um, you can't actually tell. Again, here's the kind of the micro uh, uh, demands it. You can't actually tell if a given point is going to be in this set or not. And uh, there's an open problem. And here's um, here's. Uh, uh, Roger Penrose saying, "What a fascinating structure this is. Um, even though, even though you've got very simple, uh, very simple definition, you've got something very complicated. Now, this kind of this is uh, in, in modern parlance, this is something that's emergent. It's um, it's uh, something which um, uh, you understand the underlying causal structure that that generates this. What you see is actually very surprising because you see all this." Uh, a uh, variety of um, uh, emergence patterning. And this, this connects up with uh, some later work. Um, right, human mind, um, human, uh, human uh, mathematical creativity in particular. Um, is that computable? Well, um, one, one would like to reduce um, mathema mathematics to. Um, uh, proofs, and this is what mathematicians try to do. But actually, underlying that, there's something kind of a little bit shady going on. As uh, people who've um, worked in mathematics know, that actually the way they get solutions to problems is different um, from the way they describe their solutions later on. What they do is um, his Prankerade describing um, getting stuck on a problem and uh, then finding he's got to go on a trip, as we do, and uh, he steps onto a bus, um, he goes on this trip, he step, he's, he's forgotten about his problem, he's got stuck, he can't, uh, he can't, uh, can't work it out. He puts his foot on, on the bus, uh, on, the, on, on the step of the bus, and uh, bang, all of a sudden, without him thinking about uh, this problem, here comes the solution, and, um, and, here, and the interesting thing is that without anything his former thoughts seem, seeming to have paved the way for it, he gets this solution, and uh, he just carries on talking to his friend. His friend's got no idea that he's solved this big problem in mathematics uh, while he's been carrying on this conversation. He, he goes on with his conversation, and, and he goes back at home and uh, writes out the proof. And of course, the proof is nothing like uh, what uh, the way he got the, um, the solution to the problem, because he doesn't even know how he got the solution. Now, um, I'm not going to spend much time on this, but uh, the brain is actually a big problem for philosophers, as everybody knows, uh, going back to Descartes and the mind-body problem and so on. And it's still with us, and um, it's uh, people, uh, every, every philosopher has a different idea about, um, uh, about mind-body and, and uh, computa computation of the brain and so on. Well. Um, Supervenience is the word. I mean, uh, I, 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 don't know, I find a lot of people don't know the word. It's, if, if you want to take, uh, if you want to take one, well, if, if it's new to you, then then it's it's a, it's a nice word to remember. You bring it out to the party, you know. Like, <laughs> supervenience. <laughs> What's that? You know, they think you're a real, real um, philosopher. Yeah. Well, the idea is, of course, that um, you don't. Um, whether you believe that mental thought processes are kind of reducible to what the brain's doing, you know, d d uh, can we just find out what the, what's, what's going on in somebody's mind by analysing the brain? Um, well, we've got views on that. But what the, what the philosophers have is this kind of workspace uh, which gives room for different ideas, where you at least accept that the, um, uh, that you don't have thoughts without something happening in the brain. So, um, so in other words, the um, mental mentality um, supervenes on the physical processes going on in the brain, and that that's reasonable. Most of us would, would, wouldn't disagree with that. I mean, in philosophy, of course, even that you get one or two people disagree with. But uh, but on the whole, 
philosophers work in that so within that space. And then, and then I guess it's it's up to um, I, I mean philosophers aren't going to do it. It's up to computer scientists to put some flesh on on this supervenience if they can. Uh, maybe maybe through artificial intelligence. Um, and uh, the problem, of course, is that the, the, nature of the, co the, the nature of the connection and the model of computation that's, that possibly might capture what's going on. Uh, as he, as he, as, uh, this is uh, J. Bon Kim, who, who uh, a brilliant uh, physicist, I think he's into his 80s now, but uh, he is a Princeton, of course. Um, uh, the, pro the, the, the problem is that you, if, if, if mentality, if mental thoughts are going to have a connection with um, um, the world and have an impact on it, there's got to be a physical connection. On the other hand, if you, if you make that connection too simple, then you've got um, a denial of your intuitions about um, uh, consciousness and, and uh, the way in which mental thoughts seem to have an autonomy. And this, this question of over-determination, uh, if you look at mental processes and, and have a kind of analysis of it, then you can have a kind of um, a causal structure which seems to be autonomous. On the other hand, um, if, you're, um, if you're a neuroscientist and, and you're looking at what the brain's doing, you have a different uh, kind of causal structure which, uh, which seems to relate to what the, the, uh, the, the mental process is. And so you have this over-determination. You, you can't have causal uh, structures uh, clashing with each other. And so that, that, that's, that's a problem, or can you? That's the, uh, that's the problem. So here, here we go. Um, what's coming out of this is... Um, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of kind of physicality to computation, and uh, physicality one usually um, uh, one usually expresses information. So uh, it's very common now to think of um, uh, the physical world as being a world of information, and this is where computer science comes in. Computer science can say something about the way information is handled, and that that can be imported back into the real world. So um, what we've got is a challenge to this kind of disembodied model which uh, comes from giving information a, a more important role and uh, looking at embodied computation. Um, and so what we've got is something pointing to the computational significance of information. It's not, it's not, it's not as simple maybe as it's assumed in the um, setting up of the universal Turing machine. Of course we know that in science you've got to deal with real numbers and, uh, and there are people who will say that even, the real, even real numbers doesn't capture the, uh, the, 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 um, the world in its entirety. So you've, you've, uh, you've got a possible um, need to take more account of, uh, of information. Now, um, the Oracle Turing machine, um, Cambridge asked me, do, do you believe in the, universe, uh, in, in the Oracle Turing machine? And I say, well, it's actually, um, it's actually with us. The Oracle Turing machine, um, what it does is it... Um, Gives the computer, gives the um, gives the standard model of the computer information, and it doesn't. But it, it doesn't tell it doesn't tell the machine where the information's come from. So what the picture is that you've got a Turing machine. It, it, the hardware is just the same as before, but um, it's now got an extra quadruple, which enables it to ask questions about some source of information, and. Um, one can, one can uh, using this extended model, one can, um, uh, uh, one can model, um, for instance, uh, the, the simple laws of um, Newton. You can, um, uh, you can imagine the um, the input being a description of a physical situation in terms of a real number, and then you can put that, you can make that your um, uh, uh, oracle content. And then you can have your machine asking questions about that and coming out with answers, which um, um, which can be the position of the um, particles or whatever it is at a later time. So you can you can model very simple um, causality within this uh, this model just by extending. It. Now, the um, the point about um, do you believe in the Oracle Turing machine? Well, that, that was, uh, 